Ooh. Ooh, that's good. Ooh. again everyone how are we merry christmas not merry christmas christmas is gone happy new year because it i think if i can be bothered i'm going to get this out to you on the first of january or i'm going to stick this up on the first of january so happy new year many good tidings or whatever it is that they say whatever happy new year um yeah this time around i'm going to do the video that i wanted to do first that i wasn't feeling well enough to do because i couldn't get outside as it turns out, I couldn't get outside again today, or I couldn't be bothered because it was absolutely hammering it down with rain and I didn't fancy it. So I've done some indoor examples for you, but this video is going to be the first two parts because the next one, everything I talk about today, I'm going to take you out on location somewhere and um, show you how you use all these functions when you're out taking pictures and whatever you're taking pictures of and the means in which you're doing it, whether you're doing it handheld or you're doing it um, on a tripod. But... But yes, yeah, so I'm going to give you a brief rundown, but the last video was incredibly long. Oh, yeah, an hour long. That's a lot to watch. I, it was a lot for me to edit. I don't want to be doing that again, so we're going to try and keep this shorter and sweeter, or shorter, short and sweet, or short, short and sweet, short, short, short and sweet, I think it is. I'm pretty sure it's short and sweet. Anyway, we're going to try and keep this shorter. So what I wanted to do was basically just give you a brief rundown of what's in your camera and then how these settings the, the three settings that you'll predominantly manipulate the ones you'll use the most and uh, what they do what each one means and uh, and how the three then uh, combine together and the compromises you make or whatever to get out and take pictures because i'm sure like most people if you've just bought one of these you just want to get out there and you want to start taking pictures you want to learn the rest of this later on so with this video and the next one, that's what I hope to achieve. So without any further ado, here goes. Short and sweet, I promise you. So camera, this is a camera. In this camera, in the actual body itself, you have what's called the camera sensor. Now the camera sensor, the way I like to think of it, is this is my analogy for it, your camera sensor is like your camera's canvas. That is what your image gets painted onto, what your image gets taken on, and then that pushes it onto your memory card, like your SD card or your CF or whatever it is that you're using. That's controlled, or its sensitivity is controlled by a thing that's called ISO. I'm gonna go, I've got some examples in a minute that I'm gonna show you on what ISO is and what it does. But that's the camera sensor. Then after the camera sensor, you get what's got there. I mean, there's many different things, but for this video, we're sticking to these. There's what's called your camera shutter. Now, your camera shutter, that is like your set of blinds, your shutter, your curtains that stay over your camera's sensor and stop light from getting in. Now, that's controlled by your shutter speed, which is part of the exposure triangle, which I might have put on the screen a minute ago, but if I didn't, I'm going to whack it up there now. I'm doing this off the cuff, so you have to bear with me. Um, basically your shutter speed controls how long that stays open for, allows light in and onto your camera sensor or your canvas, paints it on, and then uh, how long it stays open for and then it shuts. That's your camera's shutter speed and we'll get to that in a sec. Then after that inside your camera's lens, inside the lens on these cameras is what's called your aperture. Now your aperture or F number, your aperture is the opening inside your lens that lets light in and onto your camera sensor. So these are the three things I'm going to deal with. You. We'll, we will deal with or discuss today in as quick and as brief, but as in a knowledgeable way as in which I can show you. So the first one I wanted to go into, the first one on this exposure triangle, which should be in front of me right now, although it might not be, but it should be there, is shutter speed. And I've done some examples for this to show what it is. Shutter speed, as I've just said, if the amount of time with which your shutter opens allows light in and then closes again. Now, on this camera, on most cameras, on, on uh, uh, mirrorlesses, on DSLRs, um, that, those shutter speeds range from, uh, well, there's a myriad of settings. So how slow 
or how long it's open for, how fast, how quick it shuts, you know, how fast it's open for. You've also got a setting called bulb, which I won't get into, but you might have seen it on your camera. That's when you're uh, you're controlling long exposures with something called an intervalometer. But I'm going to do another video on that because I want to do one on astrophotography. I want to show you how I took this picture that I'm going to stick on the screen, uh, the Milky Way shot and stuff like that. But we'll do that in another video because that won't keep this short and sweet. So what I'm going to tell you, yes, yeah, so a shutter speed. So mine ranges from, and most cameras will, from as slow as, or, or as long as, 30 seconds, all the way through, do, 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 down to typically like one four thousandth of a second, which is like really fast, like, like I think quicker than blinking, I'm not too sure, I'd have to look it up, but yeah, I don't know how fast you blink, but you're really quick. Now, there's a technical side to it and a creative side to it. So the technical side to it, is obviously the longer that it's open for, the more light you're letting in and onto your camera sensor. So, and that, and obviously then the, the less time to the faster you've got that shutter speed, the less light is being allowed into your camera. Now, you use this, uh, so for like astrophotography, which I'll get into, you use long exposures because you want to draw more light in. You'll use longer exposures, um, so in that like a creative sense as well, you use longer exposures. So I use them for like this waterfall shot. Uh, I use them in a way in which um, to, to, to smooth water out, to, to smooth out running water. It um, gives it that sort of like silky effect, that sort of almost angelic effect. Um, you know, that it's just a creative way in which you do it. Uh, another way in which people do it, uh, use long exposures for is... Um, like light trails, like if you've ever seen them city uh, scape scenes, them city scenes where um, people have got like London or whatever, like a landscape of London, and you see all these red trails flying about everywhere because that's people's uh, headlight or, or brake lights or, or rear lights uh, moving about. Um, the way I like analogy that I, I say, going back to the canvas analogy, the way I see it, like a long exposure, instead of like if a fast exposure. Uh, was your or you drawing so keeping something sharp uh, a longer exposure is like you brushing something onto the scene so anything that moves on a long exposure will will brush itself paint itself across your camera's canvas your camera's sensor that's that's long exposures that's what long exposure people use them for creatively there's other things that i can't think of right now but but that's why you would use those um then you get down to like mid-range shutter speeds. Now, I use these a lot because I do a lot of landscapes. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't want a, a lot. It's just a, a way of balancing the amount ex of exposure that's coming to my camera sensor so I can keep my, my, my image in an acceptable range of exposure that I can deal with later on. Um, that would change for me sometimes when I'm doing landscapes because I've got uh, uh, moving things. So right, let me do the fast exposures first so when you're getting down to faster exposures from like one two hundredth of a second and faster than that typically you use those when you're shooting moving subjects because as in uh, you want to freeze that moment in time with a with a faster shutter speed rather than if you had a moving subject like a child running about tearing a place up a runner an athlete or something someone running about or a bird in flight if you used a long exposure as my analogy just, as I said, it would paint itself onto your camera sensor instead of, uh, of being caught at that moment in time being captured. Um, so, but sometimes people want to do that creatively. They want some moving objects in, in their scene, which is fine, but, but not all the time. If you, want a, if you want a picture and people are chatting away or moving away or something like that, but you want to capture them sharp, you need a faster shutter speed. That's the way in which you do it. The compromise to that is, though, is it's letting less light in. So that's when you'd start adjusting other settings, which I'll get to. But, but yeah, what was the thing I was going to explain then was, yeah, basically, so, so for me, like where I shoot landscapes, and I will go through this when I go out on location next week. When I shoot landscapes, <coughs> it, um, what happens to me is the uh, sometimes, like a lot of the time I can get away with like a mid to, to slow shutter speed. Um, what happens sometimes I'll go out and it's like breezy or it's raining or it's windy 
or something like that. And what's happening is, whereas I like to take a landscape, I like pretty much everything to be sharp in my image, in focus. Uh, if I was to use a norm, what would be a normal shutter speed for me, and it's raining or breezy or windy, leaves and stuff like that are moving in the scene. When I take the picture, they blur out in the scene. They're not sharp. So I'd need to start using a faster shutter speed. But I'm going to go through that next week and show you, uh, or next time, and show you if things are right. But what I have done is done some examples just at home. I set up a thing at home. I was swinging around a, <laughs> a lens hood, wherever it is a lens hood. I was swinging, I dangled it off my light. So I'm about just to give you an example of how these work. So I'm going to stick these on screen now. So the first one you see, this is one one quarter, so one fourth of a second. That's quite a slow exposure or slow shutter speed. As you can see with that picture, that lens hood is all blurred out. So going back to my analogy again about the canvas, it's painted itself on to the sensor instead of freezing it in time. Creatively you might want that to be a thing, but not a lot of the time. So you need to speed up your shutter speed. So I've given, I'm going to stick another one up on the screen, this is 1 20th of a second, so this is getting a bit faster now. You can see how that, that lens hood, because this is still moving, this lens hood, that lens hood is now, it's a bit sharper. It's still not quite as sharp, but it definitely is a bit sharper. Um, and then I've wound it down, I've gone faster to 1 60th of a second. Again, it's getting a bit sharper, but it's still, you've still got what's called a bit of motion blur going on. So I've had to get to actually get this sharp. I've had to go to one two fiftieth of a second, and that now, as you can see, that's not just dangling there. That lens hood that was swinging, but I've had a fast shutter speed of one two fiftieth of a second, and that's frozen that moment in time. So yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that gives you so the four of those side by side gives you a visual representation of what that's doing. Uh, what shutter speed is doing. I think it's quite obvious shutter speed, but just in case it wasn't, I hope that, that that's some sort of help. Now, of course, you the compromise with shutter speed, as there's always a compromise with everything in life, is that your the faster your shutter speed is, the less light you're letting in and onto your camera sensor. So that's something you have to bear in mind, but I'm going to get to that in a minute. So the next one I wanted to go to was, um, was onto Aperture. Now, aperture is now this is the f number i think i mentioned that a moment ago aperture is is the size of the opening in your lens that you can manipulate so it can either be wide or you can narrow it down that's allowing light in and onto your camera sensor and that's that's measured in or, or denoted as an f number so if people have heard me speaking about that before i know one of my friends asked he said what do you mean by like f11 that's what that is. It's graded in f or, or, or yeah, graded in f numbers. So, the lower the f number, the wider the opening. The smaller or the larger the f number, sorry, the smaller the opening. So, so it's a lot farther Ted, really. You know, like small, far away, <laughs> something like that. Anyway, but <coughs> look, dude. Um, yeah, the um, but also what it controls. Sorry. So yeah, what that controls is what's called your depth of field. Now your depth of field, if you're un not too sure what that is, and don't worry, I've done some example pictures. Your depth of field is how much of your scene is in focus. So you've picked your subject, what you're focusing, you're not focusing on, but then you control your aperture, how much of that scene you want to be in focus. So your subject will be sharp, it's then beyond your subject, what you want to be in focus. And I'll stick an example up now. So this, this is F4. So, this is how it works. So, so the lower your F number, the wider your aperture, the bigger your hole, the more light gets to your camera sensor. I don't know the scientific reasons for this, but I know there's an explanation for this. The lesser your scene will be in focus. Now, as I'm sure you can see on this F4 shot, wherever I am now, I'll just explain it. My subject in this is my camera at the end of the table. And what I've done is I've just put a few lens caps and uh, things along the table just to give you a visual representation of how that depth of field changes as I go through the apertures. So I'm on a wide open aperture, the widest that this lens will go, which is f4, you do get wider, which is what you're on now. If you're seeing me now on an f1.8, an aperture of 1.8, and what's that's keeping me sharp and in focus and everything else out of focus. Because of course it's me that you want to be looking at, is it not? No? Oh, well, but yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, so anyway, back to this picture, F4. You can see in that picture, it's got what's called a shallow depth of field. Only really the camera itself, my subject is in focus. Everything in front of it is out of focus. Everything behind of it is, is out of focus. So that I'm now winding up the aperture numbers, so narrowing the aperture size, going to F8. What you'll see is now, and I'll stick these side by side, you'll see that more of the scene is coming into focus. It won't be that obvious. I'm going to do this more, uh, show you a better example next week, and I'm going to give you an app to download, or next week, but next next video, that will give you, a, uh, on a wide vista, like a wide landscape, to show you how this helps. But anyway, you can see it, F8. Now more of my scene, more of my picture is coming into focus. And then you go to F11, and again, so, so remember, the higher the F number, the narrower my aperture is becoming. Again, F11 now, less light being allowed into my camera sensor, more of my scene is coming into focus. So my depth of field is now uh, becoming greater. It's not so shallow anymore, it's becoming greater. So more of that is in focus. And then just, I've only picked a f just four, four, four ones here. Then going to F16, again, now if you look, and look closely at the lens hoods, the lens caps. They're the things I want you to look at, the lens caps coming up through the scene. You can see now, how much more of that is coming into focus. Now if I stick all four of those together, you can see how four of those, how, you know, how that changes, and I'll stick the F numbers beneath it. So, so the wider your aperture, the more light coming onto your camera, the shallower your depth of field, so less of your scene is in focus. The higher the F number, the narrower the aperture, the less light coming into your camera sensor, the more, uh, so the, the bigger your depth of field so the more of your scene comes into focus. So yeah, so that's how Aperture works. I just wanted to show you one quick one, um, and this is basically for the women that are watching this because I know you love these types of pictures, so do I, so do some of the lads, I've no doubt, but the bokeh shot. So I'm gonna stick this up now. The bokeh shot, that, that's what's classed as bokeh. I think there's a thing for it, but it's like, a lot out of focus basically. I don't know what bokeh stands for, that is not it. Um, but <clears throat> but yeah, that's the, the shot. Now these are really good for portraits and stuff like that, like your babies, ladies, like a lot of your, your babies at the minute, you'll love these pictures. It's when you your, your subject or most of your subject is in focus and then everything else around it is blurred out. And it's a really pleasing, nice picture to look at. You achieve that with a shallow depth of field. So, this picture has been shot at f4, that's, that's the, the lowest and the widest that my aperture will go on that lens. You achieve that bokeh shot with a, uh, a, what's class, a shallow depth of field, a wide open aperture, a lower f number. As for instance, as I've just said, like you're looking at me now, my camera that you're looking at me through or from or whatever, or that you're in, that is now, that's currently set at f1.8. And that's keeping me in focus, my face, because that's what the focus is detecting, and everything else is blurred out. That's the bokeh. That's the picture that everyone, like, like a lot of people love, especially you ladies, I know you love those pictures. So that's how you achieve it. Get your aperture number down, get your aperture nice and wide, focus in on your baby's face, your boyfriend's face, even your girlfriend's face, or whoever's face, whatever face, my face. Focus in on that, take your picture, you get a nice blur around, and that's it. That's the bulky shot. So, yeah, that's that's aperture. The technical thing to remember is the wider, the more light; the narrower, the less light. But anyway, I'm going to talk about how all three of these relate. Set, definitely in the next video. But, so the next one on the exposure triangle, and the last one is ISO. As I briefly mentioned, ISO controls your camera's sensor, the thing inside your camera that your camera's canvas, the thing that takes the picture, that absorbs the photons and takes the picture of that light. Bear with me, I'm just going to see if this camera is still recording. It is, this is the second time I've done this video because the thing froze on me earlier, I don't know why. But anyway, yeah, so ISO, camera sensor. <coughs> the ISO controls how sensitive your camera sensor is to light. Does that make sense? So, it's how much, I don't know the technical size of this or the scientific size of it, but basically, like I say, how sensitive it is to light. So. The lower the F, S, uh, the ISO number, sorry, I've got two used to say an F number then. The lower the ISO number, the less sensitive your camera is to light. The higher the SO, ISO number, 
the more sensitive your camera's sensor is to light. Now that's range, they range from, like on my camera, they go from ISO 100, which is the lowest, all the way up to ISO 25600, which is the highest, which is really sensitive. Now, there's a trade-off to this though, because you would think, well, I just shoot it more sensitive, have more light, it'll allow me to narrow down other settings. But there is a trade-off to this, which I'm gonna show you now of these example pictures I've taken. Because the more sensitive, and I don't know the science to this, again, I don't know a lot of science. There's a, um, I watched a video the other day which sort of threw my finger off a little bit. But anyway, nonetheless, this is true with the ISO. The higher, yeah, the higher that is, the more noisy. So the more sensitive your camera sensor is to light, the more noisy your image becomes. Now on modern cameras, you can push that quite high. But um, older cameras, not so much. But, but still, you do get a level of noise in your image. Now, people do like to use that creatively. That's that grain that you get. You know when you see like a grainy image? That's noise in the image. It does look quite nice. It's quite a pleasing effect. But you might not always want that. Like if you're doing a big shot, I mean, you can't see them at the minute, but like I'm putting some big ones up on my wall. I don't want a really grainy, noisy image for those. I want a nice, clean image. So I have to adjust other functions to keep my ISO down low. But you can use, obviously nowadays with modern technology software, there is denoising software, which is incredibly good. But there's still a threshold with which you can go to, or I found with my cameras. But, but I'll put some examples up now anyway. So it's like the first one I want to put up, this is shot at ISO 200. And I'm zoomed right in on, a, on, a, on an old wine bottle just so you can see it. You can see that's quite a really clean image. There's, would be a tiny bit of noise there, but you, you wouldn't be able to discern that with a naked eye. And again, that's that bulky going on. In focus wine bottle, everything else blurred out. That, that's ISO 200, so a low ISO number, a low sensitivity. Now when I go to ISO 3200, because this, this new camera that you're in, it's ISO is really good. So I've had to really push it up. That's what I took the pictures with earlier. But anyway, so this is ISO 3200. Again, it's quite a clean image, but you can see noise is starting to creep in. If I zoom in, you can see there's a level of noise, a level of grain coming to that image. Uh, and then so on and so forth, going up to ISO 12800. Again, a cleanest image, but you definitely can see noise coming in. Like if you look at my chair there, the black of my chair, the cream of my other chair, you can see noise coming in on that image, a lot of noise. And then up to the highest one, ISO 25600, very noisy. You can definitely pick out the noise in that now. I mean, again, to me, it's not a bad looking image, creatively. It looks grainy, it looks old if you're going for that like 70s, 80s look. Um, it's it's quite, a, quite a nice image, you know, there's a way in which people use that creatively. but. You don't always want that. You want less noise in your image. You want a nice, clean picture. So it's just that's what's to bear in mind. So, so now I'm going to briefly touch on how all three of these relate because it's things you need to understand. It's all a trade-off. That's the way the exposure triangle works. It's all about correctly exposing your image. You don't want to underexpose. You can, like with modern cameras, and if you're going to edit your images, you know, you're going to shoot in RAW, you can underexpose, you can overexpose, and you can get back the detail. But if you're not going to do that, if you're going to shoot JPEG with these cameras, I'm not going into all that. Again, I've done that for an hour the other week. But if you're going to shoot JPEG, the likelihood is you're not going to edit your photos. You just want them pictures straight out. So you want to make sure you're exposing that correctly. But it's the very same for RAW. But obviously RAW's parameters are much wider. You know, it's thresholds. But you want to make sure you're exposing those correctly. So the way these three relate is you, you need to think, and I'm going to do more on this next time, but how, how am I shooting? So typically, like, if you're shooting handheld, well, everything you do, basically, sorry, let's go back to this, shutter speed, like faster shutter speeds, less light. Now, our apertures, less light. So, on and so, so the way you compensate for them two would be to bump up your ISO, but one thing you've got to bear in mind is, with ISO, as we've just discussed, it brings noise in and onto your image. How much noise do you deem acceptable? That will then work your way back around and, and the compromises you make. Like So with what you take with the exposure triangle, that's how all three of those work together. Now, it's, I'm gonna, I wanna do this more in detail next week or next time, because next time I wanna take you, I'm gonna take you out on location. I'm gonna show you my thought processes or process one of those two words, my thoughts and how I set up 
dependent now I'm shooting where I'm shooting on tripod or if I'm shooting handheld and then in the way in which yeah you would think it is free but but one thing I wanted to do now quickly because I know some of my friends are going to watch this they've just bought themselves a camera they want to get out and I don't blame you know we all want to get out and just start taking pictures and start having some fun you know getting a bit creative and stuff like that so I'm just going to show you a way a way in which to understand this and a way in which you can work back so if you're shooting handheld and I'll show you the automatic mode which does it in a minute but if you're shooting handheld there's a rule of thumb to getting sharp images and this is dependent on your lens focal length so that's denoted in millimeters so this one here is a is a zoom wide angle it goes from 17 millimeters all the way up to 40 millimeters so there's a rule of thumb when you're handheld shooting and this is how you finger the exposure triangle to get a a, a, a clean or, or a, an in focus image when you're handheld shooting what you have to bear in mind is, is when you take a picture you will get camera movement it'll happen i mean my hands aren't very steady and i'm sort of exemplifying it here but especially when you click the shutter no matter how still you stay when you click the shutter and i try and zoom in there you see that slight bit of movement that happens now if you're shooting at too slow a shutter speed what you'll find happening is, is that your subject or whatever you've pictured will be just slightly blurred or slightly out of focus. You'll have a bit of motion blur going on. Now, the way to get around that is the rule of thumb is to shoot at a fraction of a second that is, matches the focal length that you're shooting at. So, for instance, on this, if I was shooting this camera at 40 millimeters, <coughs> I would want my shutter speed at 1 40th of a second or faster. Now that obviously then comes with its compromises. There's another, I mean, I go faster because my hands aren't very steady. But if you're going to shoot handheld, just, just, just for now, to get you guys going, bear that in mind. So a fraction of a second that matches the focal length that you're shooting at. So if you were shooting a 200 millimeter lens, you want it at one 200th of a second. 40 millimeter, one 40th of a second. Uh, a 10 millimeter, which I doubt you are, one tenth of a second. That's the rule of thumb of it. I tend to go 1.3 times. I'm not going to do that math now because oh, fuck that. <coughs> I've got this, this image of being a smart, clever man. I, I don't want to ruin that. <laughs> I have, haven't I, I think? Yeah, anyway, that's that's rule of thumb. But of course, that comes with a trade-off. So this is exposure triangle. That comes with a trade-off. That faster shutter speed is going to let less light into your camera's lens. No, yeah, sorry, into your camera's sensor. So... It's going to risk underexposing your image. So there's two other things, obviously, the aperture and the ISO that you can change. Now, I can guarantee a lot of you, if you're going around shooting a handheld and you're doing people and stuff like that, you're going to want that bokeh effect, which I spoke about a moment ago. So that means you can wind your aperture out, you know, open it up, lower aperture number, uh, lower F number, so like five or ten, um, that's going to give you the bulky effect, but that's also going to have the advantage that it's going to allow more light in onto your camera sensor. So that, that's a good thing. But if you want a, a, a narrower depth of field, you want more in focus, obviously you need to think about winding your F number up, narrowing your aperture. Of course, the trade-off to that is, is that you're going to let less light in into your camera sensor, so a risk of underexposing your image. So the next thing you go to is what your ISO, what we've just discussed. So you'll start bumping that up to, to ex correctly expose your image so that it's not underexposed. And this is especially important if you're shooting on JPEG and you want to get nice looking pictures out of your camera. That's something you need to bear in mind. But of course, remember the trade-off is a more noisy image. But you can balance the three. And most of these modern cameras have got noise reduction in them already. So if you're shooting JPEG, stick your noise reduction on and let that sort it out for you. And, and you'll be able to shoot with a, a lower ISO or a higher ISO, sorry, and it, it won't be much of a bother. But and just one more thing: if you don't want to shoot in manual mode, these cameras are quite clever. They have two other, well, there's a load of different functions, but there's two I want to talk to you about. The first one is what's called AV. I'll zoom in on that. That is, I can't, it's probably going to be out of blur because I've got the whole fucking bogey thing going. I don't know, but yeah, if I put it there. AV, that is, next to me, AV. What that is, is what's called aperture priority. 
that means that your camera takes over, takes control of your shutter speed and your ISO and just leaves you to control your aperture, which is you just worrying about your depth of field. As we've discussed already, I'll stick one of all these pictures up, but like the bokeh and whatever and stuff, how much of your scene's in focus. Now that's good, if you're just walking, that's the best setting. You've gone out for a hike during the day or a walk, or you've just gone down a pub with some friends or whatever. Aperture priority, where you've got decent light, like natural lighting or ambient lighting, aperture priority is the best setting to be in. Because your camera automatically, what it does is that rule of thumb, it keeps that rule of thumb in so that to the millimetre, to the to the shutter speed, to the fraction of second shutter speed you're shooting. Your camera will do it automatic, automatically. Even if you're, you're zooming in and out, when you take that picture, your camera will read the focal length that you're at and it will adjust your shutter speed and your ISO accordingly to correctly expose your image. Now, I'd recommend that for most settings, you know. If you just want to get out taking pictures and you want to do that sharpish, just go into, into one of your camera's uh, you know, automatic settings and that will get you out taking pictures and you can learn about the rest of it you go, as you go along. Another one to think about, now this is going into if you're shooting moving subjects, so your kids are running around tearing it about or your friends are sitting there talking or a bird or whatever. Uh, well, birds that fly, not the ones with tears. <laughs> well, you might be taking pictures, you might be out doing the old upskirts. <laughs> I might edit that part out. <laughs> Probably best. Yeah, so um, take what's, what's called TV mode. TV mode. That is shutter priority. Is it prior priority? Shutter priority. So you are you are taking control of the shutter speed and your camera takes control of the aperture and the ISO. Okay, so that's shutter priority. So that's good for moving subjects. If you're out and about or your light's a bit low, maybe not when your light's a bit, yeah, probably when your light's a bit low. You've got moving subjects, babies are running, or kids are running about tearing the place up, or, or sports, or whatever. Go into shutter priority, then keep twiddling about with your shutter speed until you're getting that level of sharpness that you want in your image. And that's a good, and your camera will control, and these cameras are really clever. Like I said, my friend's R50, which is a crop sensor, it's their version of the, it's the mirrorless version of the 250D, which is the first camera I had. I mean, they're genius, absolutely genius. They'll control the level of your exposure, the level of the light, uh, and everything like that quite happily and give you a nicely exposed image. So, yeah, that, that's, there are two ways in which you can just get out shooting handheld uh, right now, really. But, yeah, so that's, that's, yeah, I think that is it. That's what I'm going to do this week. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed now that the camera hasn't stopped me again and this video is actually done. And I will, yeah, bid you all a happy new year once again and, and, and a do or whatever it is. Bid you adieu. Not adieu, a do. I'm going to say goodbye. And I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to wish you a happy new year and hopefully see you again for the next uh, episode or the next video where I'm going to take you out on location and take you through my foot patterns. I'm going with patterns now, not process, because I don't know if it's processes or processes. Process my foot patterns uh, of how I use these settings, whether I'm tripod shooting, what I'm shooting, and they'll shoot. So, yeah, that is it. Uh, Arriva Dirty, au revoir. What's the Spanish for good? But I've got hello. Yeah, I never want to say hello to a Spanish person or bird. I never want to say goodbye, so I only ever learned. Hola. <laughs> anyway, goodbye. Bye-bye.